Hello, and welcome to day three of the Oxford Economics of Mutuality Forum. Today, as I sit less than 40 miles from the New York City World Trade Center on the 19th anniversary of the September 11th attacks here in the US, I can't help but reflect in remembrance of those 2,977 innocent people from 92 different nations who were taken from us too soon. And in those moments, I am tremendously grateful because I am in awe of the thousands of you who have joined with us over these last three days from so many different walks of life with different experiences of and with capitalism who are coming together during this forum to look for ways to understand those differences, identify gaps and opportunities and work together to co-create a new future. One that heals business and therefore heals the world so that we will have a brighter future as the needs of our global community are met. Our forum conversation will now turn their spotlight to the opportunities we can seize to transform the way we teach business and practice leadership and to support the acceleration of mutual strategies and the implementation of stakeholder capitalism. So today on September 11th, as we think about the role we each have to play as leaders in this purposeful movement to complete capitalism and heal business, therefore healing the world, let us never forget what hate and divisiveness can destroy, but let us also remember what love and compassion can heal, especially if we recognize ourselves as instruments of peace, justice, and hope for our shared future. My name is Amanda Catherine Roman, and it is my pleasure to serve as your Master of Ceremonies. Now it is my honor to introduce Colin Mayer and Bruno Roche, our co-hosts of the forum. Amanda, thank you very much indeed. So, in day one of the forum on Wednesday, we looked at the uh, problems associated with the existing capitalist system and business arrangements uh, and an alternative approach that promotes purposes of business that go beyond just making profits. And yesterday, we looked at one of the key aspects in terms of delivering that, namely measurement of performance, impact, and accounting and valuations. Well, today we want to look at one of the key elements associated with the implementation of purpose, and that is education and leadership. Business schools should really be at the forefront of promoting change in this area. One thinks of business schools and universities as being the seat of new ideas and inspiration. But in many respects, instead of being in the vanguard, uh, we find that business schools are in the rear guard of trying to promote change. They've been slow to adapt to the changing circumstances that business faces and the changing needs of business. Why is it that business schools haven't really perhaps taken quite the lead in promoting change towards more purposeful business that we might have liked them to have done? I think that there are four or five key reasons for that. First of all, there's an immense amount of plastic capital that people and academics in particular have uh, in the existing models and in the status quo. Uh, and it takes a lot to shift that focus of what they're doing, and in particular, what seems to lead to academic success. There are questions about the availability of data uh, when one's looking at performance beyond financial measures. There's a concern about how business might react if business schools shift their focus away from what many regard as being the key element of what they do in terms of making money. There's concern about how students might react to that type of change of curricula. And then there are the problems that arise in relation to the rankings and systems of accreditation of business schools, where rankings predominantly focus on financial aspects, in particular the salaries of graduating students in the years after they graduate 
uh, from business schools. And in many respects, rankings have a similar effect on those running business schools as share prices have on those running businesses. And if we're ready to change the nature of business school education, then those ranking processes probably need to alter. But things are changing. There are more sources of data beyond financial data that are becoming available. Businesses increasingly calling out for people who have the knowledge and skills about the changing nature of business and the way of promoting more purposeful business. So going forward, that is where the career opportunities increasingly lie. Students are pushing for more rapid change in the way in which schools uh, run their educational programs. And the rankings are indeed beginning to respond by recognizing the need to embrace factors beyond those that they've used in determining the performance of business schools. Now, there are two aspects where business schools should be uh, at the forefront. The first is in relation to knowledge creation, the research that goes on in business schools. Uh, we identified some of the changing business practices and policies uh, that are needed to introduce purposeful business. And the, uh, the British Academy uh, in London has run a program on the future of the corporation uh, in which it has identified eight areas where uh, policy and practice need to change. We've talked about it in relation to uh, measurement and performance, uh, but there's also uh, the elements associated with the ownership and governance of firms. The nature of the financial system, finance and investment are key uh, policy levers uh, that might need to be exerted over the coming years. And in particular in relation to policy, law and regulation are elements that are going to need to reflect the fact that purpose beyond profit needs to be at the heart of what business does. So there really is a very exciting agenda of research that needs to be undertaken in these areas, which will draw on not just work in business schools, but other areas of universities, public policy schools, law schools, the humanities and the social sciences more generally. The, the second area where we need to see reform is in relation to teaching. At the moment, business school courses start off with the statement that the purpose of uh, business is to produce profits and everything in terms of the design of courses in relation to accounting, finance, marketing, strategy, operations, management, organizational behavior, etc. All, all of that follows from that underlying presumption that business is there to promote the interests of their shareholders. In fact, the way in which a business school course should start is by posing the question of what is the purpose of business? Why does it exist? Why is it created? What is its raison d'etre? And everything should follow from that in terms of the different courses uh, that are produced. But in addition, that notion of a much broader range of purposes immediately brings out the fact that a business school should be drawing on all of the knowledge of a university in terms of thinking about what is the purpose of business, the values that underpin it. One should be drawing on the humanities, on philosophy, on religious studies, on history, as well as from the social sciences, not just in terms of anthropology, sociology and economics, but also in terms of law and political science, to name a few, and also from the sciences as well as the social sciences. Now, there are a number of business schools that are being very innovative and inspirational in this area. For example, Rebecca Henderson, who 
talked on Wednesday, uh, has been instrumental in promoting uh, a reorientation of the uh, MBA course at Harvard with a reimagining capitalism program. In the uh, Science Business School in Oxford, uh, we have a responsible business core course uh, in the MBA program. But for the most part, business schools haven't really gone as nearly as far as what I've been talking about in terms of essentially turning a course on its head and starting from the notion of trying to define what the purpose of business should be and to derive everything from that. The uh, Economics of Mutuality Forum has, I think, had a significant influence on the way in which people have been thinking about the nature of business and certainly is having a significant impact on the way in which we're looking at business uh, education in the, side, in the side business school. But what we're hoping is that going forward, the notion of putting purpose and ideas like the economics of mutuality will become an increasingly important feature of business school education around the world. It's critically important really to help to promote and produce the type of leadership that we need in business going forward amongst the current generation of leaders and in particular in the future generations that are going to take business forward in the rest of this decade. At this point, I'll hand over to you, Bruno. Yes, good, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good night, depending on where you are joining us. Thank you, Colin, for this introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, add to Colin's word by sharing a few anecdotes. When we started the, um, when we started the economics of mutuality journey back in 2006, the question that was asked to us by the board of Mars and the management of Mars was, what should be the right level of profits for a company like, like Mars? And at the time, I, I thought actually it was a, an amazing question, but I, I was expecting actually that this question had been studied in the literature. And to my great surprise, it was not. I mean, at least in the economic and management literature, this question has never been studied in a meaningful way. They had a few anecdotes in, um, from coming from the management consultancy, from few case studies, but nothing actually systematic and coherent. This question actually has been addressed for a long, long time in philosophy, in religions, in, in sociology, but not in economics and management. And this is a big gap. And actually, 15 years later, despite numbers of books and conferences and research, it is still a big gap in the curriculum of management and economics. So I'm glad actually that we are now uh, talking about these issues. And uh, I'm glad actually that uh, business schools like, uh, like Oxford, like Harvard, like others in the world are starting to tackle these questions because it is a fundamental question, not only for, for business, but for the world in general. And I'd like to, to, to come up with a few maybe uh, provocative statements. My first boss at Mars, a wonderful gentleman called David McElroy, who was Scottish, had this expression, which actually had a big impact on me. He said, you know, the journey from ignorance to enlightenment is similar to the journey from astrology to astronomy. And in a sense, we are on this journey from astrology to astronomy, from anecdotal evidence to a proper management theory. And the same way, actually, we are asking the question, what should be the purpose of business? We should, we should also ask ourselves, what should be the purpose of management schools? If the purpose of business is shifting to 
enlarging the notion of purpose and actually to understanding that in order to, for business to continue to thrive and prosper, they have to enlarge their vision of the ecosystem in which they operate. And they also have to enlarge the notion of how you measure performance. The same thing has to happen to management schools. Management schools is all about training the next generation of leaders. And leadership actually is not exactly the same as when you are dealing with maximizing profit for your company and for your shareholder as if you are maximizing solutions, profitable solutions to the world in the ecosystem in which you operate. So my, my provocation to the uh, business schools and the students to say, what is the purpose of management schools? Because if the purpose of management schools is to deliver, is to train a, a set of leaders that are still aligned behind the old model, then we are back to square one. But if the purpose of management schools is to train the new type of leaders, which is actually about orchestrating ecosystems, it's about actually mobilizing resources behind a common purpose and measuring performance beyond traditional financial KPI, then we are in a completely different game. And when we talk about leadership and training and the role of business schools, Colin, you mentioned that actually you need to, of course, develop new knowledge. And indeed, you need to develop new knowledge. And actually, the fact that this new knowledge uh, does not exist yet in economics and in management, or is, is just beginning, requires actually that business school will have to go beyond the traditional curriculum of economics and management. It requires actually that you will have to tap into, yeah, into sociology, anthropology, philosophy, but also the humanities at large, but also in mathematics and physics. And actually, it is my modest experience that if you want to crack big issue like, like the one we're talking about, the right level of profit, or actually the next paradigm for value creation, you need to bring this kind of different perspective. So I know one of the biggest challenge that I'm facing when I deal with academia is that people like to work in silos. And actually, the silos actually are counterproductive. The same way, actually, that we are proposing business to go beyond the traditional stakeholders, which is essentially the shareholders and the employees, and actually to embrace a larger ecosystem of resources behind a common purpose, the same mechanics must happen, must apply to the business schools. So this is our, I mean, from, from a practitioner perspective, this is what I'm expecting from, from academia. So people actually who are leading the way. So I'm glad we have this, um, this um, set of business schools that are leading the way, but my calling is for business schools to go even beyond. And modestly, I mean, I, 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 over the last few years with Colin and, and Oxford, we have developed this, technology called, the methodology called economics of maturity, which starts from the purpose, which eventually goes to describing the ecosystem and new forms of measurement and even new modes of profit construction to align the purpose, the practice, and the mode of profit construction. This is not the panacea, but at least this methodology is based on solid academic research and also robust in-market implementation. So we, we together with the uh, with Oxford and the Economic Community Foundation, we are in the process actually of finalizing an elective course, something that actually will be available to every business school around the world, which essentially is an attempt to bring this knowledge that Colin is talking about, and in order to make it available to every management school and every student around the world. That's and the first thing I'm, I'm very happy to share with you. The second thing is that there are so many movements. We, are, we just counted 180 movements yesterday that actually are busy in bringing this knowledge to a higher level. And there was a calling yesterday from, from, uh, um, from Paul Polman, and he said, we need a space, a place, which actually could serve as a place where this movement and this knowledge that actually is developing around the world could actually be cross-fertilized in such a way that knowledge will be increased. 
there is a saying coming from the uh, from the old time which says that at the end of times people run here and there and knowledge will be increased we have a, a tremendous opportunity today of being connected with one another using technology and our intuition and our argument is that when people took to each other and they are organized behind a common purpose, then knowledge is increased. So this, the response to the challenge that Colin posed for the academia could be summarized in essentially uh, a few points. The first one is to challenge management schools and the academia to work, to, to, to work on their purpose and to organize the ecosystem of resources that exist behind delivering this purpose. And that means actually a transformation in the way academics work. The second element is to take stock of all the goodwill that exists today. And that goodwill exists in academia, of course, because it exists in business, it exists in NGOs, it exists in, uh, in the civil society. And as we are organizing, these forums, these round tables, knowledge shall be increased. And the third element is to realize actually that leadership development and training doesn't start only at the level of MBA student. It starts way before. And economics is a wonderful discipline that actually can be taught at a much younger level because when people reach the level of MBA business school, it's almost too late. So my intuition and our argument are there is a reservoir of great talent among the younger generations that are thirsty to bring economics to a higher level of purpose for the benefit of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruno. What a powerful charge to leave us with. And certainly there are many folks that are thirsty to bring economics to that next level. And many of them are gathered with us here today. I'd like to invite Alistair back and from the Economics of Mutuality team, who's gonna help us look at the visual on the map we've been looking at over the last couple of days to dive a little deeper into the role of education and leadership in enacting that systemic business transformation. Alistair? I think your audio needs to be turned up. Can you hear me? There we can, now we can, welcome. Thanks so much, Amanda. It's a pleasure to be with you all again. Over the last two days, I've had the joy of introducing a, a series of visual maps. And I've explained that the goal of these maps that we're using is to create shared meaning behind the big systemic issues we often discuss and debate, but perhaps still lack a little clarity and consistency on when it comes to the many interrelated relationships and implications. We have also been capturing the role of different movements and organizations in addressing these big systemic issues. Our coverage of the maps is, of course, as I've stated, not exhaustive. And with the support and feedback of others, we aim to continue to build and develop the content on them. You can view and explore all the maps on your own through following the link on the main of forum event page, but there's also a separate link that we'll be sharing with you uh, after the forum concludes. I'd like to specifically point out our open questions map. They are conversations that we believe that we need a space for in, in, our, in, our, in this current conversation on economic systems change, but we didn't get a chance to implement um, for the forum specifically. So feedback and conversation is welcome for that. This is also uh, an, an add-on that we created and big thanks to Visual Meaning, who's been our partner in, in creating these maps all the way through. This was not something that we planned or intended to build when we first set out, but felt necessary as we went through the work together. And this was, was an, a, a great example of them going above and beyond. So please go and visit this and, and share your feedback with us. Today, rather than focusing on the movements, I'll be drawing out more explicitly the diagnosis of the breakdowns relating to leadership and education then connecting these with the organizations represented on the panel. Over the last few days, we focused on the thought and influence of one economist, namely Milton Friedman. But believe it or not, there are others out there who've had some pretty good ideas as well. Let me read this quote to you from John Keynes. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. 
practical persons who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually slaves of some defunct economist. This quote of Keynes is insightful and incisive. He couldn't have had Milton Friedman in mind when he wrote it, but is there more, a more dominant idea to which we're enslaved than profit maximization? I think that this diagnosis map of our current breakdowns in leadership and education are remarkable in the extent to which it shows just how enslaved we are to this idea. The previous two maps illustrated the extent to which profit maximization structures our economic narrative, our financial institutions, our markets, our corporations, but profit maximization is an idea. And ideas are not contained only in structures, they create cultures. Think about it. Before we could even really understand the concept of a career, say at age 12 or 13, we knew what careers made financial sense. Lawyers, accountants, bankers, our definition of success had already been narrowed. The prospect of a, of a high future income was somehow exerting its influence on our young minds. While businesses maximize profit, people, you and me, consciously or unconsciously are told to maximize income. This is not by chance, it's the power of an idea. By the time we are making a decision about subjects to study at university, for example, there's almost always the advice that goes something along the lines of study something useful, like economics, law, medicine, business, but not history, theology and philosophy, not coincidentally, my educational background. Why? They constitute the training required for high paying careers. What are we passionate about? Who are we? And how it connects to our career choices is already sidelined. That isn't to say that you can't be a passionate lawyer, of course. We are being driven by the cultural aspects of profit maximization that tell us the most important thing is a high paying job. Everything else is second order. With a business, within a business school, this dynamic is magnified from curriculum to career advice to networking events and the like. MBAs program students to maximize the return on their educational investment. Let's look at this story a bit more closely. Our interviews and research reveal two key breakdowns, outdated curricula and the growing gap between research and practice. Together, these create a powerful feedback loop that keeps the traditional curriculum in place. As Colin shared, despite the many attempts and the length of time that academics and deans have been concerned about the state of management teaching, little at the core of it has really changed. This is both fascinating and disappointing. In 1988, that's over 30 years ago, two academics, Porter and McKibben, wrote Management Education and Development, Drift or Thrust into the 21st Century. They warned that business school curricula was becoming overly focused on implementation and analytics, ultimately requiring what they called an urgent overhaul. Does this, does this sound familiar? The sound of these warning bells ought to echo in our ears. Now fast forward exactly 30 years later, and let me read to you a quote from an article written by John Benjamin, an MBA student and Dean's fellow at MIT Sloan. Business school instruction is routinely blinkered. An MBA class will consider a business issue in isolation. Its challenges are delineated. Its society, societal level implications are waved away. The principal's overriding goal, profit maximization, is assumed. With mechanical efficiency, students then answer the questions of how to move forward. Individual choices are abstracted into numbers or modeled as graphs. These instances lay bare the limits of the MBA worldview as students shy away from evaluating the economy's moral outcomes or from challenging a shareholder-centered capitalism in the places that it clearly goes wrong. It's a bleak picture, but thankfully it's not the only one. Colin shared with us some bright spots earlier mentioning Harvard and Rebecca Henderson and Said's own attempts at, um, at, at looking at systems change within the Said curriculum through go-to the nature of the corporation and, and the responsible business module. We could add to that list INSEAD's New Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society, Erasmus University Rotterdam Center for Economics and Neutrality, and we'll have the pleasure of hearing from the Dean later. And there are obviously various sustainability MBAs or social impact MBA courses at various US-based business schools in particular, like Stanford. 
But these are all specializations, electives or integrative modules of some kind. The core MBA curriculum remains pretty much untouched. Let's move on from MBAs and think about another crucial stakeholder, the faculty. The second breakdown mentioned, the growing gap between research and practice, drives a wedge between research that enables faculty to reach tenure and enjoy recognition in top journals on the one hand, whilst on the other, also committing to practical research that drives the creation of ideas and teaching content in step with the needs of business and society. For the most part, the structure of, a, of academic career progression keeps academia apart from the real world practice rather than bringing them together. So our friend measurement appears again here too. How are we measuring success for academics? What are the incentive structures that need to change? Thankfully, there are bright spots worth mentioning here too. There are a growing number of actionable research organizations that sit outside formal academia, but respond to this breakdown by bringing together academics and practitioners to create practical tools, thinking, and resources. For example, Inclusive Capitalism's Embankment Project and their long-term value framework, Regenerate's Purpose Report, or Future Fit's benchmark methodology. And as Colin mentioned, the British Academy's The Future of the Corporation program. It's not simply publication pressures that maintain this narrow definition of success and keep the core curriculum in its status quo. There's a wider business school ecosystem, accreditation and testing bodies, EMFD who run Equus, GMAT who run GMAT. These bodies restrict changes to curricula too. May, it's a, any major change to your curriculum is risky because if you change your curriculum, that may threaten the membership of your, of your business school in these types of bodies, and therefore your reputation, and therefore student recruitment. And of course, rankings, as Collins already mentioned. This illustrates perfectly how, just how pervasive and influential profit maximization has been, overly weighting post-MBA salary increases as the key metric. As a graduating MBA student, you're fighting a pretty strong current not to feel trapped by the narrow definition of career success. Understandably, you're concerned about repaying debt and may feel unable to, feel, to freely choose a career most meaningful to you because of the pressure to begin repayments. So even after all the expense and stress, you may well not, you may well not be equipped to solve the problems that we most urgently need addressed. Corporate filtering along both unobservable socioeconomic criteria and the observable, more discussed criteria of race and gender produces what Cantor called homosocial reproduction. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy that reproduces the belief that people that conform to certain types of corporate criteria are therefore best suited to top management positions and so inevitably get them. We are programmed to stick within groups we know Diversity of both the observable and unobservable kind needs to be deliberately and thoughtfully managed. Otherwise, it's systematically weeded out through recruitment and progression filters. Is it any wonder that many business leaders are poorly equipped to lead purposeful companies and solve the types of challenges we face today? Here are some stats that illustrate the powerful effects of corporate filtering. 80% of CEOs come from within the company. Over half of them have engineering or MBA degrees. Across 2,500 of the world's largest public companies, only 4.9% of CEOs are women. And in 2018, more CEOs were fired for ethical lapses, that's 39% of them, than for poor financial performance. This is particularly striking because who we are must be at least as important as what we know and the credentials that we have. More and more business school executive education programs are responding to the call for different types of skills training. Many now offer courses on social impact, systems thinking, impact measurement, sustainability strategy, and the like. There are also a growing number of leadership and training organizations recognizing the same problem. We mentioned a few of them on day one. They serve leaders and CEOs without them having to return to a university setting. A Blueprint for a Better Business, Bridge, Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose, each bring their own approach from entering into a social contract with CEOs to creating learning journeys for leaders and teams, providing advisory services and guidance. Q 
Key focus areas include mindset and behavioral change. Each of these organizations recognizes that they're tackling an issue that runs deeper than a skills gap. A final aspect of these organizations' work is to create communities of leaders dedicating to putting purpose before profits. Having the support of peers is essential in maintaining a commitment to drive transformation. Representative, representatives from all of these companies will be joining us for the next panel and they can take you much deeper into their work. So from when we're born to the point where we retire, we've gone through a system that's trained us in specific skills and a narrow mindset to maximize profit for the corporation. And our own value is found in the extent to which we max have maximized income for ourselves. Is it any wonder we have the system that we have when every part of it enslaves us to Friedman's idea? Paul Pullman opened the forum by calling us to have willpower and courage to change the system. I certainly believe we need this, but I also think that the instinct to instantly rush out there and find a job that enables you to have more of an influence is not the first step. First, we must find freedom from that which ensnares us. You can't change the system if you are bound by it. This is the power of an idea. Changing models of leadership and education is just one step. Actually changing what it means to lead is the next. And that you can only truly do through practice. And so it won't be for the faint hearted. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alistair. The map has been an incredibly powerful tool for us to learn about all of the levels of the systemic change that needs to take place. As Alistair mentioned, we are going to be moving into a panel discussion with many of the leaders uh, spotlighted in his explanation. So we are going to take a momentary pause of about 60 seconds to bring all of our panelists on and we will be back with you shortly to discuss the role of education and leadership in enacting systemic business transformation and how we can overcome those leadership challenges. We'll be right back with you. Hello and welcome to the third and final panel of this year's Oxford Economics of Mutuality Forum. My name is Sonja Pacheke and I will be your moderator for this session. Over the last two days, we laid out the problems and looked at what's wrong with the current way of doing business. And we've shared and explored alternative approaches that put purpose at the center of business strategy and operations. So business can take a lead role in solving the social and environmental problems of our time. We've heard that we need the right metrics, incentive systems, regulation, more collaboration among business and across sectors, and a shift in mindset. And as Paul Pullman said on Wednesday, we need to lead business with more humanity. Paul mentioned this as a first issue we need to solve, and I think he's so right. 
This is clearly a question of leadership. None of this transformation, the system change we need, will happen without a shift in mindset and behavior. And it is people who ultimately drive this change. So clearly education and leadership development are essential parts of the solution. Over the next hour, we have the chance to dive deeper into this topic. And I'm honored to be joined by four esteemed panelists, including Professor Anne Florini, clinical professor from the Thunderbird School of Global Management in Arizona State University, Tim Middlehales, Managing Director at Bridge Partnership, Daryl Brewster, CEO of CECP, the Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose, and Charles Wookie, CEO of a Blueprint for Better Business. Welcome and thank you all for being with us. We'll shortly hear from each panelist their perspective on the key question. And as always, we look to you, the audience, to actively participate by asking your questions through the main forum event website. If you have a question that is specifically targeted at one of the panelists, please indicate that in your submission. Anne, let me start with you and welcome. Thank you, Sonia. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I want to start by thanking previous speakers in all of the various sessions because you've given me so much to build on and I agree so strongly with the points that have been made about the need for a real transformation of business education. Um, two general points before I start building on some of those specifics. One is academia is a business. It has to make money. It, it's supposed to be contributing to the public good, but increasingly it has been run as a business. Maybe one that doesn't make a lot of profit, but still business thinking pervades how academia performs. It seems to me that the economics of mutuality thinking about purpose-driven business is something that academia ne needs to take on for itself. Second general point, building a great deal on Alistair's rather powerful presentation, is that we academics are norm spreaders. We are idea spreaders. That is very much what we do. Two anecdotes there to talk about how powerfully entrenched the ideas are that we're fighting against. A couple of years ago, I was in a a session that was doing uh, executive education for people who were senior C-suite and interested in becoming board members. And of course, in our finance section, the professor came in and was talking about what's the purpose of a business, to whom does the CEO owe responsibility, to whom do board members owe responsibility. I was the only person there who was not a full-time business executive. And I raised the point about shareholder value being very problematic, probably not even legally true. And the professor knew that I was right. But there were 50 people in the room and the hostility to even having the discussion made me realize that these were all people who had been deeply socialized with the idea that they had a fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholder returns, that that was the basis of their moral compass for what they were doing. And that is the norm that we in academia have institutionalized deeply. Second anecdote, um, I was teaching undergraduates in Singapore many years ago, uh, doing a course on what you'd now call corporate purpose. We then called corporate social responsibility. And in one of my classes, a finance major came to me very upset and said she had tried to introduce some of what I had been talking about in a case study in her finance class. And her professor told her that if she did so, he would fail her because she was looking beyond this very narrow remit. So these ideas that we have been pushing and have been pushing very hard for many decades have done real harm and those need to change. The good news is, as has been mentioned, there's a lot of people working on bringing about these changes. So going back to Paul Pullman's points at the beginning, he said universities need to be far more inclusive rather than looking for who they can exclude from their education, they should look to how they can include. They need to be digitally adept because we are seeing a global transformation with new technologies. And they need to produce multidisciplinary thinkers. Is that possible? It's very different from what universities have been doing. I know for sure that it is possible because it's the reason I went to Arizona State University, which has set up for the last 20 years to do exactly those things. And it has succeeded. It has succeeded by every metric of a university on the rankings, on the numbers of students who want to go there. In every way, shape and form, it is a wild success. 
and it has managed to do all these things. So I know it can be done. As Colin was pointing out, you have tremendous forces of inertia in most universities that make these things difficult to do, but they can be done. Now, talking specifically about what we need to transform in business or rather management education, and I think there is a difference. Again, there are lots of obstacles, but there are changes that can be made. And I think the focus needs to be on in three areas. And some of this we are doing at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, um, which is, again, I am lucky to be at a somewhat unconventional place that is accustomed to doing things that are not only the traditional things. We need to do three things differently. We need to teach people business models that are about solving what you could call private goods problems, where providing a good or service is enough to meet whatever the need may be. We also need to be teaching management and business leaders and also policy leaders how they can collaborate with each other because many of the things that are needed to solve the problems that we face are a combination of things that business can do on its own and things that require a government role and or broad civil society engagement. We don't teach people the skills of how do you collaborate across these very different sectors with their very different mindsets. Those are teachable skills. A few places have done it. We could do that very much at a very much larger scale. And the third is a focus on not just lifelong learning, which Paul Pullman also mentioned, but also breaking down the silos that dominate academia, which therefore go on to dominate what people do after they leave academia, after they've had their education. One very striking example that I think needs massive attention right now is we need to be training people in finance to understand sustainability, and we need to be training people in the sustainability arenas to understand finance, to understand the laws, policies, regulations, and practices, and how we can transform the global financial system so that it actually serves public purpose, not just private gains. And I think if we were in management education to take on rethinking not just business models, but also how we train people to collaborate outside of business and how we break down these disciplinary silos, we would have a transformed education. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just ask a quick following question? You know, we're hearing a lot about CEO coalitions. Now we're wanting to bring together a movement of movements here with this conference. What about a coalition of academics across, you know, the different institutions to work together on this? Well, this is something I very much hope that um, the e Economics of Mutuality Foundation will be taking on because I think it's a very important thing. There are some efforts at this. Um, the UN Principles for Responsible Management Education, various other bodies have been trying to convene people, but it hasn't reached the scale that it needs to be reaching for all of us to find each other and be reinforced by each other. It's one of the things I'm finding tremendously useful about this conference is I'm discovering I'm less alone than I thought I was. And I hope there's lots of other academics out there thinking the same thing. Great to hear, Anne. Tim, you're a managing partner of Bridge Partnership, a global organizational change and leadership development agency consultancy to dozens of Fortune 500 brands. For the last 20 years, you've acted as coach and advisor to senior leaders of complex organizations to apply their intelligence to drive sustainable performance and long-term value creation. I'd like to ask you two questions. First of all, how should we define or redefine leadership in the face of the challenge to put purpose into practice in business? And second, can you share some examples of the personal journeys of transformation that you've accompanied leaders on and tell us which practices and tools have been most effective or least effective in helping them? Thank you, Sonia. Hi, everybody. Um, I noticed in you reading it out, it's very dangerous to write anything on a website. Um, <laughs> we're kind of humble practitioners. And I feel in some ways we kind of work in the weeds and see <laughs> um, it's really helpful. It's like it kind of raises you up and you see where it is that you might be able to be playing your little part. I think our part is we're kind of nudges. Um, I thought it might be helpful just to share three things. Um, the first thing is how we define leadership. Um, and I loved hearing what Paul Pullman said about, you know, it starts with human will. So. So how we define leadership first off, 
The second thing is how do you help create safety for execs that are very conditioned and institutionalized around particular definitions of success? And then the third thing, and it sounds a bit manipulative, but it's actually how do you hear, how do, how do you harness the kind of fear of missing out? How do you harness organization and execs fear of missing out to actually help them to look at things in a different way and have a go at harnessing disruption in a different way. So in, ter in terms of uh, our definition of leadership, you know, we, we, we're just, um, we're addicts to kind of human potential. Um, we, 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 see, we see the glory in the human being as well as the dysfunction. And we're fascinated about human and human system dynamics. And we have a very simple model of leadership. Um, we, we get very snotty about kind of competency frameworks. We say, look, largely leading and leadership, the verb, um, it, it, it distills down to two variables, your conscious awareness of what it is that you believe needs to change in yourself, in a relationship, in your team, in your function, in your segment, in your business, in your sector, blah, 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 you know, whatever your concentric circles are. So conscious awareness about what needs to change. And the second thing is then the courage to act. So if you're consciously aware and you've got no courage to act, you're spectating. Um, if you're not that aware and you, know, you just kind of have a go at things, you've got a risk of harming. And if you're neither of those, then you're just maintaining the status quo. If you look at what's going on in the world now and the level of disruption, it's very dangerous to be neither consciously aware nor indeed have the courage to act. So we think actually circumstance is really, it's proving the value of that kind of framing around leadership. Okay, so fine, you've got a frame around leadership, so what? The question then becomes is how do you support people to make a shift in their conscious awareness and how do you support people make a shift in their courage to act? And this is where we just go superhuman, because if you take a, you know, if you take a CEO of a business, they got a supply chain, they maybe got kind of products that are kind of grown in West Africa. If you take them to West Africa, if you get them to go to those cocoa growing communities, if they see the children that are enslaved in that system, they never forget it. it a, a bit closer to home, if, you, you know, if you're kind of running a big hotel franchise, um, if you are alongside the person who has to clean the room in 12 minutes, you know, make the bed, clean the room, clean the bathroom. If you're on the front desk and you have to check somebody out and you have to use four different systems and you're seeing the queue queue up, if you're having to kind of flip 800 fried eggs in the morning, it's like there's a quality of disruption to your experience about the reality of what it is that you are actually playing some part in kind of leading and creating. So. We, we see a link between disruption and a breakthrough in thinking. And then in the breakthrough in thinking, then you can often galvanize the will that Paul Pohm was talking about. So that's, so that's kind of our frame around leadership. And, it, and it's applicable at every level in an organization in our view. The, the second thing is around creating safety. Um, I, I think what economics and mutuality and particularly what value creation and how the two fit together, I think it's a massive unlock. I loved um, Paul Pullman talking about it being the kind of glue. Um, and a bit of work that I've done with, with Mars, I hope it's okay to say, but the, the, the link that they're making to their compass and, and the economics and mutuality, I think it, it's really inspiring. And to create safety, I, I had the good fortune of interviewing a number of leaders that are leading economics and mutuality initiatives, and it was fascinating. There was one difference that stood out above all else. And, it, the, and the difference was, for some, economics and mutuality and leading for that was a leap of faith. The risk was the risk of failure against the prescribed definition of success. For others, the economics of neutrality explained why their business created value. For them, the risk is not harnessing it. So you've got the economics of neutrality, you've got two fundamental different action logics that are completely opposite. So the thing that I'm really curious about is how can you use value creation, which matches most senior executives, you know, they will see their role as creating value. How do you match that? And then with a much broader perspective on what it is that we really mean by value and what do you value and what does your organization value? And then bringing in the power of purpose and the purpose of the purpose. I think it's really interesting. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? 15% of value is only accounted for, counted by the current financial accounting system or method. You know, so if you showed up at work and created value and you only paid for 15% of it, you'd be pretty knocked off. So, you know, there's, there's something about how do you help people think through the process of value creation and how do you help make it safe for people? So that's the kind of second area. And then the third area, you know, the fear of missing out is a great motivator. <laughs> it's a bit, a bit of a dysfunctional motivator. But 
you know, in, our, in our experience in working with organizations, particularly businesses, they're just amazing at galvanizing around opportunity. Um, and so if I look back the last 10 years, you know, most leadership development briefs, it will include in some way, can you help our leaders get better at leading change? Um, you know, it's kind of depth of change, degree of change, pace of change, stop making, you know, stop us being in silos. So there's, some, there's something about, uh, there's something about in, in, in organizations is a kind of appetite to go after opportunity. And I think that um, as you look at the disruptions that are happening, so the last, you know, last kind of 10 years around digital, it's been fascinating to see which organizations have really harnessed that disruption. And one of the questions we're holding is what's the next disruption? And I think actually scrutiny around what your business is for may well be the next disruption. There are already some, you know, you know, Unilever obviously is a good example. There are already organizations that are pioneering that. The thing I'm really interested in is um, Rebecca Henderson yesterday talked about the research about whether consumers actually change their buying decisions based upon purpose. And what she said is that it's very patchy. It's not that encouraging in some sectors. Yes, but mostly no. But actually the point around employees, are employees really wanting to work in the organization as you are leading it? I think that is a very, very significant disruption. And certainly some of the most inspiring conversations I have is with kind of 30 somethings in organization. And you can see they are just so desperate for their organization to be playing some part in solving some of the challenges mm. that they are so, so um, aware of. And so the, the final thing I think around in kind of the fear of missing out is that I think, and this is a real edge for organizations, which is the shift from being very, very contained to actually seeing themselves as part of an ecosystem. I remember talking to somebody at Unilever a while back and said, you know, what's the secret of your success around really activating purpose? He said, find the right NGO partners because NGO partners are brilliant at being activists and they get you they get you going and there's a real kind of dilemma it's like you open your kimono they open their kimono they're selling out to mammon you're you're kind of you know showing <laughs> kind of skeletons in the gut so there's something about how do you create capability to be able to really lead across the ecosystem i think as as purpose becomes more and more apparent somebody once said to me you know what you realize when you really go after a purpose that is meaningful you realize you, you cannot do it on your own and you have to build Absolutely. relationships around ecosystem so I'm not quite sure that's answering your question, but in terms of what we're noticing around how it is that, that, that is helpful to support leaders, those are the kind of three things that we're noticing. Yeah, thank you, Tim. And, uh, you know, I love your story about this, this experience, right? It's disruptive experience really uh, changing, um, you know, what people, the people's value system and therefore how they act. Um, just you know, I want to tell you a little bit because you can't take all leaders, you know, to far away cocoa communities and have them, you know, Put go in the shoes of a cleaner. I mean, what are some other tools or you know learning uh, journeys you take these leaders on? The, the thing that I the thing that I really love is that when you work with leaders, you're leading you're you're working with you're working with highly intelligent people. They're slightly institutionalized as we all are, but they're highly intelligent. We've got a really simple process. It's about, you know, find your adaptive challenges, i.e. those challenges that are basically you're needing to adapt to. You can't apply routine approaches to. So it's not like the washing up, known problem, known solution, just get on with it. It's like the things you're trying to work out. Um, a, a, a key tool is helping people to go through a thinking process that gets them to see the world differently, that disrupts their routine thinking enables them to be able to surface a level of insight about the about the current reality and in what ways is it blocked but also about the possibilities and then experimenting i mean you know these are you know this, this is kind of a bit, bit cliche but but then experimenting and experimenting your way into the future now most kind of short-term decision making processes do not allow for that so one of the things we're constantly doing is basically trying to trying to create the discipline of thinking differently about the things where we're not confident that we're really kind of clocking mm -hmm. it. So the combination of those two things mm -hmm. would be quite a helpful method. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent, thank you. Daryl, I'd like to go to you next. Um, you've had a successful career in business, um, including acting as turnaround CEO of a publicly traded company. You sit on the board of several high growth firms and you've been CEO of CECP for the last seven years. Um, a for-purpose organization that works with the world's largest uh, companies, I think representing about $11 trillion. Um, those are the 200 you've got in your network right now. Let me ask you two things. How can coalitions of business leaders such as CECP accelerate progress towards systems change? And what are, again, some of the tools and practices you've seen support that progress? 
And linking actually to the discussion yesterday on measurement and investment approaches, what are the areas business leaders and investors need to align on and tackle together? And how much progress are we seeing in that area or what is holding us back? Thank you, Sonia. And it's really an, an honor to be here in such a special time, right? As we think about the challenges around the globe, whether it's the global pandemic, social justice movements. And yes, this is the 50th anniversary of a pretty powerful narrative that we heard from Milton Friedman, professor at the University of Chicago, that has been talked about and used to justify all sorts of behavior in boardrooms and companies around the globe. So about time, I think, for us to update that narrative as we, uh, as we go forward. So really an, an honor uh, to, to, to be here. Uh, and, and thanks for the update on, on CECP. As we talk about kind of education and coalitions with current CEOs, it's really on the job training. So someone had in, the, uh, in the, uh, the column, in the chat column, talked about this can take 20 or 30 years to get the next generation. What we need to do is how can we make an impact on the CEOs who are there today and those who are coming up in the, in the ranks as well? So I think it's extremely important on that. Uh, second, I think this power of purpose, which is certainly a theme that we're hearing uh, today with this group, is one that's just so, so valuable for us. Uh, and you know, with Paul Pullman, who is the, uh, you know, the, 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 the czar of purpose around the globe, we need more Paul Pullmans. But how do we really create those, I think, is one of our, our real mm -hmm. challenges here. And we, we think that really understanding purpose, that why of a company, but also defining it some, who are those critical stakeholders? Time frame, which I'll come back to, so critical, uh, as well as how do you really embed that in the organization are, are really important as, as we go through those. And I think as we really look to get these coalitions together, there's a number of them. We work with well over 200 of the world's leading CEOs. What we're finding and some of the pieces that Tim mentioned, I think are really important, that people, there is a safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. There is a desire to learn from each other because it's on the job learning. When you get to be a CEO, you're expected to know most of the answers. Right. You know, it's not you know, what you learned in business school a few years ago is great. You now need to put that into practice. Your customers, your employees and others are really looking at that as, as we go forward. So we think that's really critical. I think there's four dimensions that we see that are really valuable in that. First is the research. That's a key place that academic institutions can play as we go forward. It's the numbers that that quantitative insights that says that companies that are run for the long haul, that take care of their customers, their employees, their consumers and the planet better than the others tend to outperform. It's not automatic, but the numbers are pretty clear, whether it's Bob Eccles or Rebecca Henderson's work at, at Harvard, uh, whether it's Colin Mayer's work here uh, and, and others, that evidence is increasingly there. It wasn't there a decade ago. Right? So that's really growing. And that research is really resonating with today's uh, CEOs, but it's still hard to change. Second, beyond the numbers is those experiential pieces that Tim talked about. Some of those are going out and visiting the villages of West Africa, or I used to visit our, our stores in, uh, when I ran a, a restaurant concept in the U.S., or go out and meet with our people on, the, on, our, on our production lines. Others can come from the experiences with fellow CEOs. And there's a really power, and that's one of the things we try to do in CCP, is distill the research, but also let CEOs tell their stories. Those are the case studies that so many CEOs grew up and learned as they went through, 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 through school. Um, and they're so powerful as CEOs can talk about that and you know, intelligent, bright people in leadership jobs, learning from each other and can get those insights. Uh, guys like Jerry Anderson, CEO of DTE Energy in Detroit, 2008, 2009 uh, economic crisis, CFO comes to him and says, hey, we got to let go about a third of our people. It's, that's the way we'll make our numbers. He said, let's hold on to them and make them more productive. Change that. And it actually helped change Detroit. Um, a, a, a city that had gone through great issues with the auto industry and others. There's powerful examples out there that can really help uh, CEOs really see how they can add value in that process. One of the things we do at CCP is bring companies together to share those stories. Incredibly powerful during the COVID crisis, which was much faster, vaster, and likely going to last longer than anybody expected. There was no blueprint, no game plan. So CEOs had to learn in real time from other CEOs. One of the best was a CEO, Mauricio Gutierrez, um, CEO of a major U.S. utility who had a global who had a global pandemic strategy, shared with other industries what they could do, and it really was remarkable what happened in food and consumer goods and other industries as they learned from each other. So that real time case study learning we think is really important. 
frameworks that can bring that together so companies can manage across the group. And then we've really got to create the platforms, the platforms of having these exchanges. And that, I think, is one of the areas we are really focused in on CECP, is how do we get those CEOs and investors together to answer the second question you raised, to really have a dialogue around business, its role, is it a business in society or business for society? And the magic piece we've seen in these conversations is when we change the time frame from what happens this quarter to what happens over time. The vast majority of the value of every company that has listed companies, well over 90%, is its future cash flows. And what are the drivers of those that are happening today, like human capital, engaging with your stakeholders, uh, material uh, management of material, ESG types of risk. So that time frame piece we think is really critical. And part of what we've done at CECP, based on input from investors and CEOs, is to create a platform where companies can share their long-term sustainable business plans, their corporate purpose, how it all fits together um, in a public forum with investors to answer those kinds of questions. Moving us, it's not an ant in either or, you still have to manage in the short term, but how do we really understand that purpose and the framework of what the company's doing? Paul Pullman has presented, Emma Walmsley, uh, GSK has presented, come in from the, from the States. And by the way, a classics major at Oxford. So you don't have to be in, uh, in, in finance to make it to the top major companies. Uh, but they've come in and it's really, done. we've had some 40 companies present. Uh, we're now scaling that up. It's a real opportunity. And we believe every listed company should be sharing their long-term plan. And that's what we're working with uh, as we go forward. So I think it's an area we can have the dialogue uh, with investors and companies by changing the, fr- the time frame from very short term, where the noise is, the hedge funds are, to longer term, where the investment is, and the big difference there between trading and investing. Great, Errol. Very clear. Power of storytelling and learning as a group, right? But also just changing the, the framing and uh, it, it will change the outcome. Thank you. Charles, I'd love to come to you now. You're actually a qualified accountant, but your professional background spans business, government, I think an economic think tank as well, and a policy for a major faith institution. So you truly bring a cross-sector perspective to the debate. And since 2014, you're CEO of Blueprint for Better Business, a UK-based cross-sector network of business leaders, investors, academics, and policymakers that works to stimulate and energize, you say, positive behavioral change. I would like to ask you to bring us back a bit more closely again to the role of education and leadership in embedding purpose into mainstream business. What shall we expect from leadership in companies, both at the organizational, but also at the individual level? And how can business schools and also other key influences, to Alistair's point, help create and support leaders to make the right choices and take that courageous action we need. Well, thank you, Sonia. Um, uh, No problem at all in eight minutes to answer those those questions. I mean, I'd like to start by saying uh, I completely agreed with what both Colin and and Jay said at the start of of this session and Alistair as well, and indeed everything pretty much that my fellow panelists have said. So let me say a word about leadership and then a word about education. But to start, I'd just like to step back and just offer our perspective on what leadership is about here. Um, I mean, our belief is that purpose-led businesses have two dimensions to them. One is a very clear reason for being in terms of benefiting society. And the second is that businesses, the business sees itself as a social organization and a series of human relationships where the good of people and the impact on people is part of and an intrinsic part of what the business thinks about. And I mentioned that second aspect because one of my worries actually is this whole purpose movement grows. And I think it's wonderful. And of course, it's what we're in, in, in as exists to help promote is that you can have a great purpose and you can have a strategy that follows from it and still be a terrible place to work and not really care about people or the environment. And I think what we need to think about all the time is these two things together. So being purpose-led for us is both about the mission and about seeing the business as a series of human relationships. And it's actually only when you bring those two things together that people will feel emotionally committed to a shared worthwhile endeavor, because then the authenticity will come through not only in what is said and what is done, but in the way it's done in the quality of human interaction and behavior. So I think the implications for leadership and education really, in my view, follow from that 
starting point. So in relation to leadership, there's this human dimension alongside the strategic dimension and the uh, alignment of long-term strategy and value creation, uh, which Daryl was rightly highlighting as a crucial thing. And let me just give you two examples of what we see in terms of this other side of leadership. One is just simply creating good relationships. So a good, a good example would, for us, a recent one would be Mark Kudifani, who's the CEO of Anglo-American. At the beginning of COVID, he said, let's consult all our communities where we have mines, which they did, and ask the communities what we can do to help. So he put the whole resources of the company at the service of the communities. He didn't say, this is what we're going to do. He asked them what they needed. And then what came out of that was a very, very powerful uh, way in which the company, because of their extraordinary presence in South Africa and other countries, they're able to do a huge amount. Another example would be another business leader I'm working with who's got 6,000 poorly paid staff. Just before Christmas, they made a commitment to increase the pay of their bottom 6,000 to the real living wage. Then COVID struck. And what he did, interestingly, was he said, we're going to honor this commitment. They were going to do it in April. And he said, we're going to do this. The only way they were able to do it was by deep, by everybody paid over 70,000 pounds in that company taking a pay cut. And they all did in order to honor the company-wide commitment that they made. And the CEO led that because of his belief in the quality of relationships. And a third example would be a company that we've been doing a lot of work with, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, now NatWest Group. Alison Rose, when she announced their new purpose in February this year, the CEO, at a conference I was, I was present at with 150 of their leaders. The way she did it and the team did it was saying, this is where we want to go. And we're asking you what you feel we can do to really bring this to life. So the dynamic between the leadership and the, and the wider senior executive of the company was all about an invitation to find out and to work together to create value through realizing higher quality relationships in the organization. So the dynamic was the opposite of the kind of top down, here we've got a purpose, we're gonna tell you what to do. It was all about creating relationships. So that's what I, I mean by, by, by good relationships. And, and my kind of um, hero in this is, is a guy called Vaclav Havel, who was one of the Czech dissidents imprisoned by the communists in the 1970s. And in one of his essays, he writes that leaders have a choice about what they appeal to in people. Do they appeal to their fear and their greed and their selfishness and their um, self-interest? Or do they appeal to their generosity, their innate sense of wanting to contribute? And of course, the point is we've all got these in ourselves. We've all got these different buttons that can be pressed. And that's a choice. It's a choice that leaders can make, which creates a different kind of culture. And that's what I mean, I think, by this capacity of leaders. And the second aspect of leadership, I think, is this um, capacity to create it's psychological safety, I think. And it, this is where, again, where there's a risk for purpose because you can have a visionary leader who has all the right ideas and is amazing, but actually paradoxically can make it difficult for people who disagree to say so. So one of the things that's really important is to create the space in which people can have honest debate and disagreement without fear of failure, or without fear of that not being heard. And, and we say to businesses, it's super important to get a shared belief and shared belief isn't everybody agreeing with the CEO. Shared belief is where everybody is, for their own reasons, come to a belief that this is best for that business. And when you've created the space in which that shared belief can arise, you are in an amazing place. Because from that shared belief, you get um, the real coherence of, uh, of the power of the relationships. And there's a lot of work to do often to get there because we're dealing with these very deeply entrenched ideas. So I think that's super important. And it's also reflected in the quality of relationships you then get, which I've seen through COVID and also through the Black Lives Matter thing, where it was so interesting to see, and again, this reflects what Daryl was saying about leaders creating the space to listen to one another and to talk about the difficulties and being vulnerable about the difficulties of dealing with very difficult situations. And with everybody working virtually with issues like the Black Lives Matter thing coming up, business is humanized. Everybody's seeing everybody else's living room. Everybody's just a person. And so you've got a much more, much stronger sense of this human characteristic of businesses, which I think is really good. Um, and it's placing greater demands on leaders, but very different demands on leaders from the ones that they had before. So I, I'm conscious of time, but let me just say a word about education. I completely agree with what Colin and uh, Bruno said about the purpose of the business school. That is the core question. And my provisional provocation as an answer would be, a the business school today should be about producing excellence, creating excellence in the practice of purpose-led leadership. That I would say is a good starting point to challenge yourself as a business school. 
And if you if 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 we're moving to purpose led business in the world, the job of the business school is to create purpose led leaders. And in my view, purpose led leaders are marked by competence and character. A lot of the things that you taught now still need to be taught, but there's a context in which they're taught and the way in which we think about human formation, if leaders are going to be able to do the kinds of things that I was just giving examples of. So we can come into the discussion about what some of those things might be. And I've got some thoughts about that. And perhaps I'll just stop there. But I, I think that that is the core shift. It's what is the purpose of the business school? Excellence in the practice of purpose led leadership, which is this broader human concept. Thank you, Charles, for so clearly formulating that challenge to business schools. A true call to action here. Um, you know, we've had uh, questions coming in from the audience, and, and there's one, you know, that I think uh, you started getting into, but I'd like to, to throw back at, at all of you. And this is really around, you know, we've been talking about leaders at the executive level, right, C-suite mm -hmm. or, or senior executives. But what work is required in educating and bringing along the teams below? Um. Shall I just pitch in on that? Sorry, sure. uh, just a thought here. We did a session with some HR directors uh, about the problems of becoming purpose led. And they said, yeah, you know, the young people in the business are fine. The C-suite are fine. It's the permafrost layer. It's all those people just below. It's all those managers who won't do what we want them to do. And they were all moaning about that. And then one of them said, excuse me, if all these people are frozen, who froze them? Mm -hmm. So what conditions have we created in which these people have these stresses? And all, I think, I mean, I'm sure you would all agree that these large organizations live or die by the quality of their middle managers and the conditions that they created to enable those people to do their best work is completely fundamental to this happening. I'll stop there, but that would be my um, opener. Yeah. Who would like to jump in? Tim? Anne, go ahead. If I could just pick up on, on the point that you just made. Um, it brought back to a couple of very powerful memories. One was um, when I was doing a bunch of re research in Southeast Asia on, there was a huge movement to how do you engage sm shareholder, smallholder farmers in big value chains and ways that benefit them and improve the environment and you know all the good stuff. And in the field research that we did, we would go out having talked to the CEOs who had great vision and having talked to locals all on board. And then we talked to the people who had PL responsibilities, profit and loss responsibilities, and that's all they were focused on yeah. because it was all they were actually assessed on. So this, this permafrost layer, that's a great term for it. Mm -hmm. um, the, there had not been an adequate attempt by the leadership of those companies to figure out how to engage the next level down and the level below that in any really meaningful ways. And it turned out to look much more like greenwashing, even though that was not the intent of the corporate leaders. They were actually quite serious about this. So this is a massive problem. Absolutely. And I think part of the response is, you know, there've been questions coming in about, we can't just train the next generation. We can't wait 20 years. We need people to change now. Well, part of what business schools in particular do is a focus on executive training. And more and more, the business model for management schools is based on the revenues that come from executive training. And I think that has to be, it's not just the, the regular curriculum for an MBA student that has to change. It is very much Absolutely. the executive education that has to change. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's similar to um, my experience. It's interesting working at the level below the kind of exec level or maybe a, a level below that um, around each development often it kind of polarizes in two groups you've got one group what they're seeing they almost become caricatures they their definition of success and therefore by contrast their definition of failure is a caricature of what it is that they see up there and in some ways you can talk about stuff up there but it's what i call the when push comes to shove test when push comes to shove what are you actually going to be assessed on your success your failure and that's the thing that determines how it is that people show up. And the level of cynicism and skepticism, I think is very healthy. Um, there's also another group of people and there's a quality of ingenuity. And sometimes you get it in kind of different parts of an organization. Often we talk about clients, but actually often our real clients are some people in organizations, they can see how it can be different and they create their own coalitions. It's finding those people and you know, vertical development will have a kind of lens on what you do on how you find them and what they kind of look like. It's those people in organizations that actually usually are the highest performing high potential individuals. 
It's finding them and helping them really become an animating force in the organization. That gets really exciting. Yeah. I, I, I share the middle management is really can be a challenge. The CEOs often get it corporate purpose today. They're the personification of the company. Uh, a lot of the people who are coming into the organization really understand some of the need of this. They're, they're looking at you know, generations in terms of the, the time. Middle management can be a real challenge uh, within the group. I, I think the areas that companies can really help out, certainly executive ed is a, is a factor, but most happens on the job. Most experience and most development really happens on the job. The questions that senior management ask, I think are really critical. I think that can be really helpful. Um, providing this time frame, which is a big area we focused on. So many middle managers, they're the ones who are supposed to deliver the quarter, hit your sales number, forget about everything else. Making sure they have a balanced scorecard across time frame. Are you developing your people for the future? Are you planting the seeds uh, of the future? Are you developing the next pipeline of new initiatives for the future? Those areas can really help to do that. Can be really focused efforts, but they're helping you to build for uh, a better, uh, a bigger future area. And the last is really finding those who, and I think it's in Tim's point here, finding those who are really purpose driven, because they're the ones who are going to be the drivers of the organization. Mm -hmm. Some are at that point kind of they're, they're the experts; they know their space really well. They're kind of along for the ride. But who are the purpose driven though, among those who can really be leaders? And how may you get them together on cross organizational or even cross company initiatives? And that can really kind of turn people on to the next round where they can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. So identify the social entrepreneurs, right? I think social that's entrepreneurs, yeah. That's the term that we use. Excellent. You know, and the, there was there was another question coming in, and you know, now we talked about middle management and how to really um, you know engage everyone in the organization. But if we go look beyond the boundaries of the organization, um, someone asked about you know how do you make sure as we're waiting you know for business schools to drive through this transformation and so on and the new le leaders coming out, you know how do we how can we accelerate progress by connecting those that work on societal impact spaces? So, you know, public health professionals, for example, with businesses. So, you know, they can take part in the debate and help uh, the learning experience and help progress that way. So this is really cross-sector collaboration. I know, Anne, you've, you've written on that, about that. And it's something that's very difficult. Um, and so I guess there's also a bit of a role uh, for education and, and equipping the future leaders uh, as well in, in uh, being literate in that. Yeah, I, I would love to jump in on this one because um, I spent 12 years in Singapore, you know, I was a regular tenured faculty, all of that. But I spent a lot of that time creating a specialized master's program in cross-sector collaboration because of this very strong feeling that we've got the sustainable development goal you know, goal 17 is we are going to accomplish this through this cross-sector collaboration. And yet over and over and over again, when you look at the practice of it, they don't accomplish what they set out to accomplish. There are millions of them now. It just You have multi-stakeholder collaborations all over the place. There's a set of skills that you can teach. And this is something that academia needs to do. It's actually incorporated into the, the program that I'm now running for Thunderbird in Washington, DC. Um, although it's not the whole program, there's a set of skills that you teach on how do you set this up? You bring in people from all the different sectors, you put them in the same classroom together, you teach the business people, what do you mean by theory of change? You teach the civil society and government people, what do you mean by a value proposition or a customer funnel? They are literally not speaking the same language. They do not understand each other. And then you teach each of them about the others what kind of metrics do they use? What are they held accountable for? We make everybody have at least a basic understanding of corporate accounting because with that basic understanding, you understand the pressures that business people are put under because of the metrics to which they're held accountable. If you do that, you can get a much greater success rate out of these kinds of cross-sector collaborations because the questioner is absolutely right. If you have businesses that are affecting the public health space, but they're not talking to people who do public health and they're not talking to the people affected by their practices, you are not going to get a, an effective purpose-driven business. Very true, very true. And you, you know, I, actually, I, um, if I may, I, I'd like to jump in on that one as well, because you know, I've, I've worked in this uh, field in the past, cross-sector collaboration, and it is so difficult. But one thing I also wonder is, is just in how far we need to change uh, recruitment practices 
um, that allows young people or, you know, as they're growing, going through their career to go from one sector to the next. So they learn to speak these different languages and then, you know, naturally become the translators when, you know, they go from an NGO into the business or into a government organization. Um, yeah, I was wondering, you know, maybe maybe Tim, you have a perspective on that. And, you know, especially it's especially hard to go from the nonprofit uh, to the for profit sector at the moment. We, we've. Um... For a number of years now, we've had something called the Bridge Institute that um, a number of people kind of founded. And basically the purpose of the Bridge Institute was to say everything that we think we've learned about how to try and help support or system change in organizations. How do you take that into the world around some kind of really seemingly impossible challenges? And um, what, we've, what we've been experimenting with there is how you bring business, civil society and government together. It tends to be quite localized. We've got a 10 year program in India around um, how to kind of make some progress around child trafficking and um, sexual violence against children and, and young women. And what we've learned there is that actually, if you give, if you can convene the right group of people, they're basically the change agents in different organizations. If you can convene them, if you can give them the disruptive experience if you can support their own personal resources, so this comes back to kind of human will, the inside out kind of version that we that, that, that we, we find quite powerful. If you can help them find their resourcefulness individually, if you can help them identify what is it that they can collaborate around. It sounds quite small, but actually you start to build momentum. So we're into our kind of third year there. And what's interesting is that what we're learning about systems change from that is now informing how it is that we're working in organizations. So I think there's something about what we, what we were told is what's different about this is usually we turn up and we all have a conference and all of us just share our own perspective. What we do is we basically give them a leadership development experience mm -hmm. using the vehicle of coming together and collaborating. And then, you know, the discipline is how it is that you kind of follow up and the, the kind of action learning approaches from that. But, you know, if we could, um, you know, the, the thousand blooms that, that Paul was talking about on Wednesday, you know, if, if that could be replicated, we call it our SDG 17 offer because, you know, that's the partnership. <laughs> offer. Um, if we can do that and, we, and just kind of briefly, actually for organizations, uh, we work with a client in Malaysia around the nutritional paradox. So they're a, they're a very innovative food ingredient uh, business. And what they were what they were really frustrated with is how do they convene enough people in the ecosystem to mobilize some kind of movement around the nutritional paradox. So the way we grow stuff, the way we make stuff, and then what we give people to consume is basically value erosion and destruction like yeah. nothing else. So how do you kind of have a go at interrupting that? So it was really interesting to see how some of the outcomes from that happened and things, the impact kind of endured. And that kind of theory of change and the logic model, I think is absolutely brilliant in business. Sonia, yeah. can, I, can I just add two yes. points? As, as well on this, which is that um, I, I, Colin kindly has been inviting me the last few years to to come in and, and uh, do a day on his elective at Sai Business School on the purpose of the corporation. And I've been really struck at Sai by the breadth of um, students from different, not only internationally, but also previous experience, both from the NGO sector, social enterprise, as well as business, which seems to me to be really brilliant. But my provocation, actually, as I think about it for the business school would be, if you think about what we're trying to create here, which is purpose led organizations, that's a general problem. It's not just about business. It's equally about the voluntary sector and indeed the public sector. I remember years ago working with Sheila McKechnie, who was the uh, who ran Shelter, which is a great homeless charity. She's just taken it over. And she said, Charles, this is supposed to be a campaign for the homeless. It's not. It's a home for campaigners. And she said the whole the whole charity actually needed to rediscover its own purpose. And charities can be run by their fundraising departments to raise money in precisely the same way that businesses can be run by the over overweening desire simply to develop, deliver profit for shareholders. And, uh, and if you look at the Stafford report into, or the report into Staffordshire Hospital by uh, uh, Francis, the QC, he said the problem with the hospital was that the managers thought that their purpose was to save money, not, not patient safety. So, so when purpose goes awry in any institution, you get these dysfunctional effects. And I just wonder whether, to the point about uh, cross-sector collaboration, if there were courses in which people in leadership roles in different sectors came together to study together, not only would you alleviate some of the language problems that Anne was talking about, would be create a sense of community around what a purpose-led business or enterprise or department that genuinely is at the service of people would look like. Yeah. I have to say that's exactly yeah. what we're what we do. 
We bring okay. them together from the Obviously. different sectors. <laughs> but we're one small program. What we need to have is this needs to be everywhere and it needs to be yeah, in, well, in executive education and it needs to be done on a massive scale. We should tell Peter Tefano. And just uh, <laughs> you know, a few thoughts uh, on this. And I think this notion of kind of intentional diversity by bringing thoughts groups together can just be so powerful, whether it's, you know, whether it's a racial, whether it's geography, but also just different backgrounds. We've been blessed at CCP that roughly half our team has MBAs and half has MPAs, mm -hmm. public administration. And that balance, I mean, sometimes we have issues, the difference between an outcome and a goal and those things, but it really does bring some different perspectives. Uh, and certainly the MP MPAs really help the MBAs think a little bit more forward, aren't so much single focused on one goal. So those are valuable. Second, there is a movement, I think, of a lot of companies at the board level. Uh, Pepsi with Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation on the board. J&J uh, &J with Ann Mulcahy, successful CEO, but also the chairman of Save the Children on the board at J&J. &J. Those perspectives can really be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about middle managers, one of the practices I had as a CEO was getting our middle managers, those up and coming, to serve on boards of relevant nonprofits. It gave them a whole nother view. First of all, it got them thinking out of the box of just what's happening this quarter. They Thank brought back great insights. And by the way, they really helped the nonprofits. <laughs> so that blending and mixing can, I think, be really valuable. But it needs to be smartly done. It needs to be done intentionally. Yeah, and it needs to be brought to scale, right? There's, it's, scale. there's a lot of great initiatives going already, but we need to bring it to scale. Um, there are many more questions that I would love to bring to you, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, on Wednesday, Colin Mayer asked Paul Pullman what advice he would give to current students wanting to contribute to the system's change in business. In the last five minutes of our discussion, I'd love to ask each of you to briefly share one piece of advice for existing business leaders wanting to play their part in transforming business into a force for good. And you can choose if you want to talk about top management or middle management. <laughs> Where should they start on their journey of purpose-driven leadership? And what should they do differently, concretely, starting tomorrow? I'll take a crack at this. Uh, and mine would be that for both the individual, their group, and their organization is to develop their purpose, be really clear about that, individual, group, organization may have one, and then to lay out their sustainable long-term plan. What are the key strategies they have, the stakeholders mm -hmm. they want to engage with in that purpose, the material risks they may see. So they really have a game plan to go after that. And as things happen like COVID, et cetera, you can respond and react, but having that plan really can kind of help focus those energies, efforts, as well as development of the, uh, of, of the team. Very clear, thank you, Daryl. Charles? Uh, so I think mine would be, um, going back a bit to what I was saying earlier, I think, think about what you deeply believe um, and uh, only then really um, enter into the dialogue with others and start from that. Because if you, and, and, it, and if that belief is experientially grounded, and you've been there, you've seen this, you know it works, the authenticity that comes through in the way you then lead is so much more powerful uh, and it's real. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is, is shut up and listen um, uh, and, and genuinely listen um, to as many people as you can. I mean, obviously not, you know, you don't want to spend your whole life listening, but I've been very struck by the quality of listening of some of the amazing leaders I've been lucky to, to work with. And they really are very good at it and they know it matters. They know it's, and it also it's quite a rare skill. Thanks. Tim? Um, you said we could be a bit provocative. I, I, um, I, think, I think purpose is at risk of getting um, completely debased. Um, I mm. think that somebody once told me a brilliant question you ask when an organisation says it's just come up with its purpose. And the question to ask is, what's the purpose of your purpose? Because at one level, you've just bought usually quite an expensive corporate accessory. On the other end, you just define what you would lay your life down for. And you need to decide where are you working across that. Right. So asking that question of your organization, what it does, it flushes out the gap between what you espouse and what you really live. It comes back to my when push comes to shove question. What is what is the purpose of this purpose? And in what way is this making us a greater creator of value than it did before? Mm -hmm. And if there is an articulate answer to that, then keep challenging for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. And you want to round us up? Yes. So um, 
just a, a thought experiment, something that would be useful for picking up on Tim's point, which I think is an important one. Give people the thought experiment of imagining what if Google and Facebook were purpose-driven corporations that, who, that were actually driven by their ostensible purpose of positive connectivity? What would that change in their practices? That gives corporate leaders a starting point for what would need to change every step of the way. Um, sometimes it's your inherent revenue generation model may be seriously problematic and you need to think about that. In general, for any business, you have to revamp your human resources function. You have to revamp what you train people for and how you do the training. And you may have to revamp your accounting practices. Purpose isn't a let's have a nice vision at the top. It is a wholesale reconsideration of the fundamental functions of your company. Mm -hmm. And it can be, let's not forget, the companies that have done this, it can also often be very financially rewarding, but it really requires this deep dive through all the levels of your company. Thank you for leaving us with these inspirational words. And now on behalf of the whole forum team, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and excellent contributions and also the audience for the great questions. Thank you. Thank you so Over much. to you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, for thank you all. Moderating Bye. such a phenomenal discussion. Uh, we're seeing lots of great feedback already out on all the social channels. So thank you once again. We're now going to hear from someone that's been mentioned earlier today, uh, Dean Angar Ricker, who is with the Rotterdam School of Management, who just recently created the Center for Economics and Mutuality at Rotterdam's Erasmus University. So we will be able to hear from him now. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to address you here at the fifth Economics of Mutuality Forum. I hope that you have enjoyed the sessions over the past few days as much as I have. As much as participating via the screen can be exhausting, I relish the additional opportunities this gives us. In particular, the opportunity for a much larger group of people to take part and interact with one another without the need to fly around. If you look at the energy consumption of universities, a very significant chunk of it is a result of conference travel. And I feel this is something that we shouldn't be proud of. And the financial costs of this are usually borne by the taxpayer or by fee-paying students. Both of these stakeholder groups increasingly demand explanations why we as academics actually contribute in this way to the destruction of the planet and then even have the impertinence to do so at their expense. The corona crisis has forced us to find fairer and more sustainable solutions. Which then brings me to my main topic for today. Can business schools really be forces for positive change as we at RSM claim in our mission statement? And if we were able to do that, what would this transformative power have to look like? How can we possibly help to meet the needs of the world? Let me make a few comments on principles. First, I see business and management studies as firmly embedded in the social sciences. Management doesn't have a unique disciplinary base. It draws principally on three foundational disciplines, namely economics, sociology, and psychology, but then also on a whole range of other subject areas, history, law, philosophy, right through to technical areas of study, and very importantly today, information systems. Personally, my own formative years took place not at a business school. I first studied at a religious college and later at the London School of Economics, and I benefited greatly from this. But in addition to the more general point of being in an interdisciplinary endeavor, I see us at business schools as being part of the design school of thinking. We need to be the space where people debate and learn about how to redesign design and redesign and then lead social and economic systems that we call companies and other value creating organizations. Where we study not only how to play by the rules of the game, or much worse, how to use these rules to our own private advantage, but where we actually ask, are these the right rules? Whose interests do they serve? 
can we achieve better outcomes for all with new different sets of rules? If you're an MBA student, take, an advantage, take advantage not only of what your business school has to offer, but what the whole of the university can give you. Get outside of your own circle and interact with students and faculty from other disciplines and allow yourself to address fundamental questions about economic design, about the principles. Second, business schools have for too long had too much focus on questions of value appropriation. In other words, on the question of how specific individual stakeholder groups, in particular shareholders, manage to get their hands on value created by other stakeholder groups. If we want to be a force for positive change, then our primary focus must be on what Colin Mayer and others call the purpose of business, to provide profitable solutions for real problems that people and society face, that is, to cater to their needs in the most efficient ways. And again, this calls for the application of design thinking in our curriculum. We need to teach and allow our students to innovate. In other words, to find better ways to identify and then to address and solve those real underlying human social problems. This is what I call value creation rather than value appropriation. What then is the purpose of business schools? And how can we be a force for positive change? Of course, I can speak here only for Rotterdam School of Management. I see us as pursuing three closely related purposes. First, we are engaged in the production and dissemination of new and impactful knowledge. I see this as a truly cooperative endeavor. Let me give you an example. Together with other colleagues here at Erasmus University, in spring this year, we set up a center for the economics of mutuality. This is now one of the four economics of mutuality research labs. And each of those labs has a particular focus area so that we complement each other well. For us, this focus revolves around the notions of ownership and governance. Allow me to expand on this very briefly. If you think about ownership, ownership is commonly understood as a set of rights or claims that those parties called the owners have. In particular, ownership is often seen as a combination of two sets of rights, namely the right to control the thing you own, either directly or indirectly, and secondly, the rights to receive the residual returns that flow from the thing that you own. For example, if you own an apartment and rent it out, you're entitled to the rent. You have agreed with the tenant. This, need, this needs to be qualified a little bit. We are talking here about the residual returns, that is, the returns that are left once other legitimate claims from other parties have been satisfied. For example, as a landlord, to come back to that example, you may have to pay taxes from the rent that you earn, or you may have to pay for the repairs, and this will reduce the returns. However, when this conventional view of ownership as a set of rights is applied in the context of companies, a lot of problems become evident. <coughs> a classical one is that many shareholders in particular have very little incentive and very few possibilities for engaging in control. Also, in many public listed firms, shareholders have very little interest in the dividends, that is, in the residual returns that I mentioned, they are far more interested oftentimes in the share price movements, and they seek to capitalize on that. But share prices often have no relationship whatsoever with the underlying economic or social realities of the companies they own. But in addition to these incentive alignment problems as they are known, there are other even more fundamental challenges. For example, can we be really convinced that private ownership is the best possible form of ownership. My colleague Percy Heuchens and others have shown that contrary to widespread opinion, public ownership may not such a, be such a bad thing for the performance of firms. We have researchers, for example, Hans von Oosterhout and others, who are working on employee ownership. And another colleague who is just joining us, Tina de Moore, addresses questions about the governance of the commons, pieces of land or other types of assets 
that are not owned by any party if you use that conventional definition of ownership I mentioned earlier. And going a step even beyond that, why should we conceive ownership only as a set of rights, but not also as a set of responsibilities that come with those rights? As a German by background, I don't mean to extol the virtues of my home country, but I confess that I'm very fond of one particular sentence in the German Constitution. Article 14 of the German Constitution says, property entails obligations. Its use shall also serve the public good. This is a very bold statement. And I dare say it has served the country very well for these past 76 years since the German Constitution was adopted. At RSM, we want to understand the rights and responsibilities from the design perspective that I mentioned earlier, the rights and, uh, and responsibilities associated with ownership. If we do so consistently, I believe business and business education will look very different from how it does today. Which then leads me to the second purpose of the work as a business school, and that is to educate our students. Now, that sounds straightforward enough. After all, we call ourselves a school. However, I believe that many academic institutions are in danger of focusing on the intellectual development of their students only. And that's certainly important, but we need to go beyond that. Some schools add another dimension to this, namely the ability to do, to apply, to implement. And surely that is important too. But I think we need to push it even further than that. As a school that helps to shape future generations of leaders, we also need to educate our students in terms of their being, their identity as humans, their values, and the objectives that they pursue. I see the transformative journey that our students go through in the course of their studies across our program portfolio. In our MBA program specifically, the vast majority of our students come from outside the Netherlands. And we pride ourselves of having an extremely diverse group of participants. The learning from one another in, in, is an important part of the learning experience. But it's also the opportunity to find and to express your own voice, for example, to develop yourself as a person. That's why we put a huge amount of emphasis on personal leadership development and on coaching not just on career coaching, but on self-reflection, on interaction with others. We want our students to leave our school differently from how they came to us first. And third, I see engagement and impact as a genuine purpose of us as a business school. By their very nature, business schools are multi-stakeholder organizations. We are called business schools for a reason. We want to have a positive impact on how companies work, how they are managed, on the way they define their purpose. We are not a consulting firm because we don't sell our advice. And that gives us actually a unique advantage, an independence which I believe we must cherish. But nevertheless, it's an area of activity that we must manage purposefully and systematically. Allow me to give an example as to how we try to do this. At RSM, we have developed a machine learning algorithm that allows us to track how our intellectual thought production relates to the achievement of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. This so-called SDG tracker can be applied to the full set of intellectual outputs as long as they are digitized, not just articles in peer-reviewed journals, but also student thesis or seminar papers, case studies, reports, and many more outputs like that. In other words, we try to measure the extent to which our work makes a real contribution to solving the underlying problems the world around us is facing. In sum, I do believe that business schools can be a force for positive change. Through our knowledge, our production, our teaching, and our engagement. I know my answer is not a perfect one. There are strong reasons to doubt that business schools can be a force, a source for good. 
but there are also strong reasons to be very hopeful. And this forum here is one of them. And my particular hope is with the students who are here with us today. I urge you, be the change that you want to see in this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Richter. It is a wonderful reminder that we need to move forward purposefully and systematically and be the change. A uh, great example of someone who we believe is being the change is our next speaker, uh, an Oxford MBA. I'd like to welcome Jillian Gideon to our virtual stage. As an Oxford MBA graduate who dedicated her career to improving lives through sexual and reproductive health services and information. After working with Burmese refugees and migrants in Thailand, she co-founded an international nonprofit dedicated to empowering youth to advocate for their rights. She's here today to talk with us about the importance of the social sector and its sustainability. Welcome, Jillian. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I just wanna thank all of the panelists and speakers ahead of me. I wanna echo everything you said. I agree wholeheartedly with, uh, with all of your suggestions and, and advice. I wanna talk about the social sector. Specifically, I wanna talk about the importance of nonprofits and their sustainability especially since they're an important part of systems change, as we've already seen in previous talks today. Early in my career, I pursued a master's in health sciences, and I focused my research on women's health in conflict and crisis settings. My determination to work with vulnerable populations had stemmed from being raised by my parents, both refugees from Lebanon who came to Canada and showed me that circumstances and opportunity can really change a person's life. And that was my driver to make sure that everybody had favorable circumstances and opportunities so they themselves can live to their fullest potential. So in pursuit of this mission, I conducted field work on the Thai Burma border with Burmese refugees and migrants. And whilst conducting my interviews, I learned very quickly that many come to rely on a nonprofit called the Maytow Clinic. Now, when you walk into the Maytow Clinic, you can see that it has an extensive menu of services. You've got the outpatient clinic to the right, you got children's inpatient unit and outpatient, outpatient unit in front of you. You've got cataract surgeries happening twice a year. And most importantly, you have these essential maternal and reproductive health services when you turn the corner to the left. All of these services are free for the refugees who face structural, political, and geographic barriers to accessing health. So when I asked Dr. Mung, the co-founder, the founder of Maytel Clinic, about their women's health services, she told me that they recently introduced the IUD. Now, for those who have no idea what types of contraception exist, the IUD is a long-term uh, contraceptive method, and it's incredibly effective, very reliable, very safe. And it's very useful for those who are constantly on the move, such as these women who were migrants and refugees. So when I said to her, well, fantastic, now women have another option uh, to you know, prevent unwanted pregnancies. She said to me, yeah, you know, we're happy with it, but we're actually not sure how much longer we can offer this device uh, since it depends on whether or not we get another donation of the kind. And it was this point in my life that I learned that the reality of nonprofits. Traditional nonprofit organization structures are built such that their operations and services are high impact and life-saving, but mostly dependent on donors. A donor can wake up one day and change their mind and say, you know what, I don't want to put my money in this area anymore. And just like that, the income stream for that nonprofit is gone. The survival, growth, and scale relies on something that is not always in their control. And yet, in our map towards better business futures, nonprofits hold a key role in this evolution. So let's dive deeper into this a little bit. I want you to think of a, a nonprofit organization, anyone. It could be one that you donated to, one that you fundraised for, or one that you consulted for. And I want you to think of the mission of that nonprofit and its purpose. What gaps in this world was this nonprofit trying to fill? Now think about that mission and whether or not solving for this mission is an important component of a new economic system, one that looks at profit, but also looks at social and environmental well being. More likely than not, the nonprofit you are thinking about is working towards something that this world very much needs. Whether it's less hunger, better education, human rights, 
that nonprofit is an important part of our stakeholder map. Yet their very dependence on external support is the biggest challenge for 81% of nonprofit leaders. And studies show that half the people working in the social sector are on the verge of or are already burnt out. And that's scary. If we care about nonprofits and their missions, then we should care about the way that they are structured. I am part of the percentage of people, of nonprofit leaders who feared the sustainability of our organization. You see, six years ago, I co-founded an international nonprofit where we had a clear and high impact mission. We wanted to make sure that every youth had access to sexual health information and services. And I can tell you, we put our heart and souls into this mission. We wanted to make sure that every individual knew everything that they needed to know during their youth so they can make educated decisions and get the services they need. With just three paid staff, we managed to scale our educational programming and leadership curriculum to 80 countries. We motivated hundreds of youth leaders to join our movement and educated thousands of young individuals about their bodies. What's really cool though, is that we engage with governments from Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia to amend laws and budgets to support these services. Our mission was important. You can't have healthy working populations unless those populations have agency over their own bodies and health. And yet the struggle to survive as an entity was our daily reality. The status quo is hampering creativity and innovation in a sector that so desperately needs it. And if tri-sector leadership is key to shifting existing economic systems from shareholder focus to stakeholder focus, then we really need to work together as equals. To do this, we must uplift and empower the social sector. So how are we gonna do this? Well, the world has more socially minded people today than it has ever had. Purchasing power has shifted towards more sustainable business and more and more people pursuing MBAs are doing so to learn how to apply private sector strategies to public concerns. The first thing we should do is leverage growing numbers of sustainability and socially focused students in business schools to shape curricula, host conversations, and boost cross-sector learning. We learn about finance, yes. We learn about impact, uh-huh. But a bridging of the two is warranted if we wanna creatively solve the issue of donor dependency among nonprofits. I can firsthand speak to the power of socially minded classmates in an MBA. I just graduated yesterday and almost 20% of my cohort had come from the social impact space before doing the MBA. I've learned so much from each and every one of them. But most importantly, the contributions that my peers have made have enhanced class learning by challenging deep rooted business ideologies and fostering discussions and debates that everyone can learn from. But this needs to be standardized. Just as how business schools have introduced mandatory business ethics classes, they should also introduce mandatory sustainability and systems mapping courses to make sure that everybody who walks through the doors gets the insights into responsible business and the creation of a business ecosystem that serves all. Second, I believe we should channel our efforts into uplifting and empowering existing social infrastructure. We see a lot of these you know, 48 hour hackathons and workshops organized to bring people together, find a solution to a problem. And they serve the purpose of raising awareness about different issues, but these often have very little follow through. Instead, we should work with those who have already dedicated their time and lives to growing, testing and scaling solutions so we can strengthen existing efforts. For example, led by nonprofits. So instead of just coming up with your own solution, Find an organization whose sole mission is dedicated to solving that problem and find ways you can help them, whether it's technically, strategically, or even financially. Why do we spend so much energy reinventing the wheel when there are people out there already doing the work and they need our help? If we do this and we do it successfully, we'd be opening up a communication channel between nonprofits and members of the private or public sector. And this will level out the playing field connect the dots to see what resources could be shared and create co-mentorship relationships that will shift mindsets and behaviors related to existing problems, solutions, and roles that different sectors need to own. This process would yield the very leaders needed to tighten the gap between the social sector and the private sector. Finally, and most importantly, 
we need to seriously act on improving the diversity and inclusivity of genders, ethnicities, and backgrounds. I cannot stress enough how important it is that every company, team, and social setting have an array of backgrounds, expertise, and lived realities. In order to truly create a world that is less extractive, we need leaders and workers that are exposed to new ideas and controversies in order to help bridge gaps, broaden positive influence and reach, boost empathy among top leadership, and act on new perspectives and strategies. Tri-sector leadership is the key to a new business world. And fostering public, private, and social sector relationships, communication channels, and leaders is what it will take to tackle the, co the complex challenges related to a new value-based economic system that we've been dreaming about. Favorable circumstances and opportunities can really change a person's life. And we can make this happen for everyone if we work towards an all-encompassing value-based economic system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jillian, for your powerful words. We've certainly been hearing about the need for cross-sector collaboration throughout the day today and throughout the whole forum. So your example is a powerful one and call to action. I do wanna take a moment uh, to thank all of our speakers for sharing their wisdom through the course of the last three days. To all of you who have been participants, thank you for joining us and contributing to those conversations and collaborations. Also to the working group and steering committee that made this event possible. Thank you for your leadership and stewardship of the forum and our technology partners and AV team who have helped us make it possible to share and stream this forum around the world to thousands. We know this is just the beginning of our work together and we are looking forward to continued engagement as we learn and grow together to elevate humanity through business. I'd like to welcome Colin Mayer and Bruno Roche back to our virtual stage to answer the burning question that I know so many of us have on our minds, where do we all go from here? Colin and Bruno. Brenda, thank you very much indeed. So we come to the end of this, the fifth year of these forums. Where, where have we gone since the first forum in 2016 and where we call for uh, significant change? Well, the world has changed. It's got worse. It's got worse in terms of the environment, health, inequality, social exclusion. There's been no real progress in a material, measurable sense. But there has been a profound change in view. Purpose, corporate purpose, has in many respects gone mainstream, having been enunciated by the uh, CEO and president of BlackRock, Larry Fink, adopted by the Business Roundtable, become the uh, primary campaign of the Financial Times in terms of the new agenda, capitalism, time for a reset, become part of uh, this year's World Economic Forum around the purpose of the company in the fourth industrial revolution. And what coronavirus has done has been to emphasize still further the significance of the notion of corporate purpose as being part of a social compact between government, society, and business by which government and societies have bailed out the business sector in return for the expectation that business will not only help economies come out of the current malaise, but do so in a way that is inclusive of all stakeholders. And business cannot make the same mistake that it made after having been bailed out in the financial crisis and the uh, skepticism that that created in terms of the response by the financial system. Purpose has to be at the heart of this recovery. And it's no longer a question of whether or why companies should have a purpose, but what and how. What is the purpose of business and how should it be implemented? A purpose should be one, as we've emphasized, of solving problems profitably. And we've emphasized the importance of measurement and education 
uh, in relation to its implementation. Measuring impact and performance and reporting on them, valuing and accounting for the cost of cleaning up the mess and the investments that need to be made. Educating and teaching current and next generations of leaders. We've had tremendous insights into all of these areas over the last few days. Progress is now being made, but it's not enough and it's not fast enough. We've recognized in these last few days the systemic nature of the problem that we face and the need for a coordinated approach that in particular Paul Pullman emphasized in his opening remarks. Business working in partnership with governments, universities, the not-for-profit sector, as well as with other businesses. Now, although we've taken issue uh, with Milton Friedman's famous doctrine about the only social purpose of business being to increase profits, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, there is another statement which Milton Friedman made, which in many respects rings truer at this point, when he said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, brings about real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. It's therefore our duty, he said, to produce new policies, keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. Well, it is becoming inevitable. And the only question that now ar ar arises is, how many more crises will we need until we realize that the other statement that Milton Friedman made about the purpose of business was incorrect and the cause of many of the problems that we currently face. Let me at this point just turn it over to Bruno. Thank you, Colin, for uh, reminding us the, the history of economics over the last uh, 50 years and actually the, uh, the importance of, yeah, the importance of naming things properly. I think there are a few good news that we would like to emphasize at the end of this forum. The good news is that we now have established a natural law in business and economics that actually the maximization of profit for the sole benefit of shareholder is not an optimum model for value creation, even for the happy few that are the shareholder. That there is a better model, and the better model that we described is the one that actually is centered on the notion of purpose, that includes the definition establishment of reciprocal relationship with the with the key stakeholders material to the purpose and that the profit definition has to take into account the positive and negative externalities that comes with the definition and the production of performance. This actually is no longer a business philosophy or a dream. It is a solid and well-established set of principles which actually have been tested and developed in an in a academic environment, but also have been tested across a wide variety of business cases. So we just don't, can't say anymore that we don't know. We know. That knowledge is not complete and it, should, it, it may actually be nebby, never be complete, but at least we start from a body of knowledge. And with knowledge come responsibility, which is called, according to Poliani, the responsibility of knowledge. When you don't know, you are less responsible than when you know. That's the first thing I'd like to say, that actually that knowledge exists and now it needs to be implemented. That knowledge exists and it needs to be incarnated. So we also established the importance of words. 
And the words is the way you define purpose. The word is the way you define your strategy. We also establish the importance of the numbers, numbers to measure performance. And there is a, a definition, there is a quote that I like very much from Oscar Wilde. We said that the, a cynic is a man that knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. And when we talked about the notion of corporate accounting, and when we were reminded actually only 15% of the value that's been created is taken into account by the current accounting system, we shouldn't fall into the trap of trying to give a price to the things that are material to the performance of business, but without doing the value. And it comes to the importance of people. And people of school means leadership, the current leadership, the current leadership and the next leadership. Many things have been said in the previous panel about the importance to bring the existing generations of leaders into a higher level of awareness, a higher level of knowledge, a higher level of responsibility. There is also the importance of bringing the next generations. So education is key, but I think there is also this notion that Hans Gar reminded, the notion of ownership. The notion that ownership is a convention. And actually the ownership today has been in service of a specific set of, of hypotheses, which actually have shown their limits. So I am grateful to the Rotterdam School of Management and Ansgar in particular, to lead the effort in uh, understanding the notion of ownership. The same way profit has to be redefined in order to align performance behind purpose. Also the definition of ownership and the rights and responsibilities that are attached to ownership has in my view to be refined. That's in my view, the next frontier for this notion of responsible business. We also, as a third um, thing actually, which is critically important to engage a system change is the importance of honoring the other people. And honoring in the whole, the acceptation of the word means to weigh with the proper weight, which means actually we have to recognize that many things have been done and many insights have been developed over the last 10, 15 years behind this topic. And to take the analogy that's like a thousand blooms from which one can make a beautiful bouquet, there is also an element of understanding and weighing what each of these initiative and movements is bringing to the debate. Moving forward, and in order to incarnate and to bring this notion of new purpose to life, it is our argument and our calling that this has to take place at least among three groups of people. First, the board of directors that actually set up the vision, the incentive mechanism, and have the fiduciary duty of managing the performance of business. The second one, the second group is indeed uh, the leaders, the leadership team of the companies. But the third one, which is often ignored, is the importance of the finance function. And it is my argument that over the next decade, finance will be transformed in such a way that it will be back, it will be restored to be in service of the economy and to help the economy to be in service of society and the environment. So if there is one thing actually that I like to, you to remind is the importance of transforming and reforming the finance function. Finance play a critical role in bringing this notion of transformation of purpose-led ecosystem-based business model to life. I'd like to finish with, uh, with, with two quotes which are dear to my, to, my, to my heart. The first one is that when we say that we, are, we have established a natural law, actually, remember Colin, you started your, 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 the, uh, this today's uh, session with saying that business school is, was lagging behind. And in a sense, one of the purpose of science and academia is to, of course, is to innovate and bring education, but it's also to decipher 
and to understand and to leverage natural law. And the natural law that we talk about, which is essentially the notion of purpose, the notion of establishing reciprocal relationships with others as a way to, to overperform and to bring prosperity to the world, to yourself, is not new. I mean, I, I like this quote of King Solomon, one of my favorite authors, 3,000 years ago, and he said, a man gives freely and still his wealth will be increased and another keep back more than his rights, but only comes to be in need. So this notion that your prosperity depends on the notion, on the type of relationship you're established with others is not new. It's been part of our culture. It's been part of our DNA. It's been part of what, how we've been wired and the return to these natural laws in business to bring prosperity to the world and for ourselves is what actually we are trying to enact and to bring to life through a series of scientifically proven um, insights, but also through education. I'd like to leave with, uh, with maybe uh, uh, something that you'd find hopefully uh, um, full of hope, but also full of humor. Is that there is this old quote from a German philosopher, Schopenhauer, who said that every truth has to go through four stages. The first one is that truth is ignored. The second stage is that it is ridiculed. The third one is that it is violently opposed. And the fourth stage is that it is accepted as self-evident. So I think on this journey from ignorance to enlightenment, and for this journey of truth being ignored to being self-accepted, we are somewhere between the third and the fourth stage. I thank you very much, and I look forward to welcoming you next year, hopefully in a, in a way that will be more presential, with that we will have a chance to connect physically on the forum that Colin Mayer and myself would like to organize uh, in probably around the Q4, two, Q2, sorry, of 2021. I thank you very much. And I hope that what we share today in a way that is humble and also but full of passion will guide your steps towards your own calling and, and also towards making you uh, actors of change wherever you are. I thank you very much and I wish you wherever you are a good afternoon, a good evening, or a good night.